Okay, so uh, welcome everyone to this New South Wales History Week event hosted by the History and Ancient History Disciplines at the uh, University of Newcastle. And this is part of our regular um, uh, seminar series, which takes place on most Fridays of the teaching semester. And we bring together uh, speakers who are modern and ancient historians, both public historians and academic historians, as well as archaeologists, museum and library professionals, archivists, translators, and other people working in the broad field of history. Uh, and if you're interested in our uh, many talks on many different topics, you will find our back catalogue available on our YouTube channel, which reminds me a quick note that we are recording and this recording will be published on our aforementioned YouTube channel, History at Newcastle. I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land, wherever you may be located, and to pay my respects to elders past, present, and emerging, and in particular to the Pamelon clan of the Wabagal people of the land on which the Callaghan campus resides and where we in the room are located today. Our presenter today, uh, Catherine Colborn, is Professor of History at the University of Newcastle. Her scholarly work has ranged across histories of mental illness and institutions, colonial families and health, and museums, collections and exhibitions of psychiatric histories and objects. Her many works include her new book, Vagrant Lives in Colonial Australasia, Regulating Mobility, 1840 to 1910, which was published by Bloomsbury this year. Her paper today stems from this work and is titled Finding Out About the Histories of Vagrant Lives and Resonances with the Present. Cathy, over to you. Thank you very much, Sasha, and uh, thanks for the, the lovely introduction. Just wanted to mention uh, that the theme for the New South Wales History Council History Week is Marking Time, and I will refer, refer to the ways in which I'm trying to sort of mark a moment in time in terms of historical writing about vagrancy, social history writing, uh, in this seminar. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about my new book, which came out in May. So I'll be telling you a little bit about that book uh, on the way through. And I'll just share my slides. Give me a little moment to do that. Thanks, everybody. There we go. Thank you. So this book is an attempt to really in a way, as historians, we're all encouraged to think about the impact of our work in the present. Uh, and especially now, universities are exhorting all the disciplines um, in the humanities, social sciences, as well as everything else, to find purpose and to be impactful and to find connections with our, our the world around us. And so if we take that History Week theme of marking time, what I want to do is make connections between the past and the present in terms of what we term today homelessness or living rough. But to do that, what I want to do is look at 19th century evidence. And I'm drawing on one particular chapter of my book uh, as I talk to you today. The book considers the precarious lives of people who were arrested as vagrants. And sometimes through the talk, you might hear me talk about vagrants. So of course, I mean putative vagrants or people arrested as vagrants. And they were arrested on the urban colonial streets, on roads, in the countryside, uh, all over the colonies. My book focuses on New South Wales, Victoria, Tasmania, and Aotearoa, New Zealand. And indeed, the genesis of this project dates back to my time in New Zealand, and the earliest research I did there dates back several years. Vagrants eked out a very marginal existence. Their relative powerlessness in their lifetimes is illustrated by the stigma and criminality attached to their poverty and life cycles as mobile people. So the sources for this study are a patchwork of social history materials, and they come from newspaper, institutional records, so newspapers, I should say, and journals, institutional records, medical writings, diaries, and published accounts of vagrants and their lives. I was particularly interested, partly because of the inspiration for this book, to find connections in terms of the world of people in the present and the past. I was particularly interested to look at themes such as where did people find shelter? Where did they sleep? What did they eat? So food and drink and community. How did they form social bonds? Because all of these strands and threads help us to form a kind of composite view of the vagrant life. 
I also try to piece together in the book uh, individual narratives of people who uh, were arrested as vagrants, and they're created from accounts of their arrests. And the idea here is to help find, uh, provide a focus for deeper understandings of what life was like, but also to humanise these people who often appear uh, simply as, you know, um, names in the historical record. So against the backdrop of all of this, we can interpret these precarious lives on the colonial streets. But at the same time, I would ask you, as you listen to the historical evidence, to keep our own historical times in view. At a time when we see increased homelessness and housing crises, uh, lack of access to health care and the rise of conservative cruelty towards people in need reminds us of the urgency in documenting histories like this. And I put cruelty uh, in inverted commas because I think we can interpret some social policy as cruel. Uh, I mean that deliberately. Just going to progress my slides here. So this is the book, and the book covers a number of themes. Uh, I do talk about legislation and policing, and I talk about certain populations of people who became more vulnerable than others, such as aged and people living with disability. And then I draw it all together by talking about a kind of wider narrative of colonial mobility um, and the way vagrancy fit, fits into that narrative. But today what I want to focus on is the everyday lives of vagrants, which is chapter four of my book. So the lives of vagrants tell us much about everyday mobility, and this was a mobility that was part of the repertoire of people who lived as vagrants. They were told to move on by police who encountered them, and they were also, uh, you know, the judgments were passed about them by the language of the courtroom. They were defined by a surveillance which had become routine in colonial settler society by the middle of the 19th century. There's newspaper commentary, um, you know, much newspaper commentary uh, about vagrant women and men who were found sleeping in the open air or hiding in buildings and barns. And this all reinforced their strangeness in colonial life. And there's also reports of vagrants who found opportunities to operate as petty criminals, mostly thieves. But these tend on the whole to focus on the failings of these people rather than expressing concern about uh, support for people in need. There are some instances of colonial contemporaries worrying about people and expressing the need to help them, but mostly there's a focus on the failings. So what I wanted to do in my book is focus on the agency and creativity of these people living as vagrants, trying to read sources from different angles to understand vagrancy from below. And in social history, we talk about history from below. So the idea here is to look at vagrancy from below. The experience of vagrancy is therefore situated in a wide social context, and I try to paint a picture of the shared and divergent histories of mobility, poverty and welfare across all the different places described in this book. The data that the book rests on uh, is just here for illustration. I will mention all the way through. I'll just leave it while I'm speaking to you. So in the Australian colonies, over 86,000 people were convicted of offences against good order, which included vagrancy, by the end of 1910. And it's very hard, as I say in my book, it's very hard for us to get an accurate kind of count of who was a vagrant because of the different laws across these different colonial jurisdictions. So I try to piece together different ways of expressing this. So there were earlier um, numbers counted at intervals, which showed more than 30,000 convictions in 1875 and more than 50, 57,000 in 1885. In New Zealand, vagrancy prosecutions increased in the years after 1850, which, as historian Miles Fairburn argues, was one consequence of immigration. Vagrancy rose from being the 13th most common crime in 1850 to the third most common crime by the 1880s. In 1879, the number of vagrancy prosecutions peaked at 29% of every 10,000 people in the country. So they're just some numbers, and I talk about this in a, a little bit more depth in the book. But they remind us of the extent of the vagrancy problem in the minds of colonial authorities. In the past, as I've just alluded to, it's been difficult for historians of crime and policing to draw on accurate sources of data relating to criminal prosecutions. But it is possible to use these discharged prisoner lists you can see on the slide to provide a suggestive account of vagrancy prosecutions and to marry this with other data. However, I didn't want this to be a data heavy book. And what I wanted to do instead was to really focus much more on uh, qualitative accounts and storytelling. So it's been a real patchwork 
of source material. But um, all the discussions in the book do rest on this uh, a number of different data sets. So while it's possible to look at the suggestive uh, material through vagrancy prosecutions, it's also possible to interpret vagrancy as a way of life in different colonial places. And this is through published and unpublished written accounts of vagrant mobility. And we're able to see the activities of these people labelled as vagrant by reimagining their lives through a concept of resourcefulness. Everyday life has been theorised by sociologists interested in changing spaces following industrialisation and different population structures that arose with emerging economic, economic conditions of the modern era. Ways of life were affected by physical spaces, by the nature of work, and by the formation of social groups, such as neighbourhoods. So to describe the everyday lives of people who lived as vagrants also means finding out about their more precarious lives as they went about the task of seeking shelter, places to sleep, and coping with bodily illnesses and physical setbacks like injury and disability. Now, this was a historical period when work in the colonies fluctuated according to seasonal needs and population changes. And again, I'd invite you to think about the present as I reflect on some of these things. So just think about the increased mobility of, of work, uh, precariousness of work, and similar things we've been talking about our, in our own society. So there's this uh, fluctuating seasonal work. And then there's also expectations of a self-governing colonial world, preferably one without a visible poverty problem. And this was forming as a discourse in the colonies. People had to find ways to survive and thrive outside of existing or nascent systems of welfare and community support. So this did mean forming social connections and bonds in different places, as well as framing an understanding of belonging and the outsider to existing communities. In other words, people in the colonies who were trying to settle formed ideas about who belonged and who didn't. Yet from the Aboriginal and Māori points of view, the Europeans were the strangers. The lives of Indigenous Australians had persisted for a long time before the arrival of British newcomers, the strange invaders who assumed control of their lands. Māori peoples in the 1840s, the time when Europeans settled the places of Aotearoa, were well organised and inventive, as Europeans found. Across multiple fronts and on different shorelines, the British sailors, convicts and immigrants who kept on arriving from the late 18th century were printing their notions of mobility and settlement onto a place with existing sets of laws, ways of life and stories. Seen this way, the mobility of the Europeans was even more audacious, as were their habits of controlling the movement of others in their midst. Writing about the stranger, sociologist George Simmel suggested the position of the stranger stands out more sharply if he settles down in the place of his activity, an idea which continues to remind us of the paradox of mobility and stopping for people who were charged as vagrants in the past. The evidence shows that people were moving all the time in transient patterns of life that were shaped by their social context, such as the need to work and the physical world, which was still forming around areas and social groupings. As neighbourhoods and localities sprang up, people took on ideas about settled cultures within them. The whole of the colony, uh, colonies could also be said to be a microcosm of social class, of new arrivals who'd been there long enough to establish contours and to exhibit a vague hostility to newcomers. And I love some of the evidence that I found about Sydney. In John Ward's perception of Sydney in the 1850s, people took on a Sydney look that was characterised by a mixture of suspicion and curiosity, so anxious to discern the real character of an individual. And of course, this probably sprang from this uh, need to delineate who had been a, a convict or not. The watching of people in public spaces by police was at the same time drawing the boundaries of gender, ethnicity and class. And these were nuanced by the specificity of the social context, as well as by local geographies. So the writings of commentators who observe the world of colonial characters and social types present an opportunity to get inside the worldview of the period, so long as we uh, remain alert to the studied practice of journalistic writing of the time. One of the inspirations for my research is a historian who was writing in the 1980s about Melbourne, Sue Davies or Suzanne Davies. 
and she refers to the way writers Marcus Clark, John Stanley James, also known as the Vagabond, and John Freeman each depict these outcast types. She labels the journalists themselves as colonial slum journalists. Historians Graham Davison and David Dunstan also compared the Australian writing about low life by colonial writers to the generic conventions of the British correspondence of the 1840s, suggesting that colonial writers use London as the yardstick for their portraits of urban place. Looking through the eyes of, of the vagabond in his essay about the police court in Melbourne, Outcasts of Melbourne, published in 1876, or through the lens of John Freeman's Lights and Shadows of Melbourne Life, 1888, gives the sense that values and identities were already somewhat entrenched in the colonies. Other writings about the colonial world by visitors and travellers, such as the novelist Anthony Trollope or writer Richard Tupany, suggest that more compassionate readings of houseless people and the destitute existed. And they were also bound by literary conventions of the age, but also acted as a check on the social milieu of the urban elite, whose own respectability uh, was in part derived from good character and charitable action. Social observation of women and their poverty and mobility in Britain formed the basis of important calls for the social reform of poor laws by the early 20th century. Embarking on her own adventure in living as a tramp, writer and social reformer Mary Higgs visited workhouses, wards for tramps and other places where women on the move stopped for shelter. She uncovered and wrote about the way women could be victims of sexual exploitation and how women also faced other dangers. In the colonies, women writing about the world of social structures include uh, journalist Catherine Hay Thompson, who, like the vagabond, wanted to experience life in the social institutions of the period to write about them. She spent time in disguise uh, in the Kew Metropolitan Asylum in Melbourne. So we have this type of literature that gives us a kind of a sense of the worldview and the, the social milieu um, that characterises and frames mobility, particularly the mobility of vagrants. But despite these opportunities to look at vagrancy and poverty by contemporaries, it's more difficult to get close to mobility for the person defined as vagrant through these words. Discovering the process of mobility, that is to say, how did people actually live as vagrants, as evidenced by the historical subject of the vagrant, is dependent on being able to read sources really carefully and against the grain of interpretation as so much so social and cultural history encourages. And I mentioned earlier the patchwork of sources, newspaper evidence, photographs, prison, institutional record notations, official inquiries into poverty and charity. All of these uh, offer um, more insight into the lives of the everyday experienced by contemporaries. So what I want to move to now is talking about um, this defining of everyday mobility and, and the everyday mobility of the vagrants uh, that I've been able to uh, imagine through these sources. I mentioned earlier um, sociology and the relevance of everyday life as an object of study has been important to sociologists, but also to urban historians and micro histories in many different contexts. And here we see more possibility, but also challenges. Uh, the density of urban life in the present has been read, for instance, as a site for understanding how strangers mix and mingle, making meaning out of interactions. Yet the past throws up challenges of accessibility and viewpoints not easily um, countered by methods such as close reading. And it's really hard for us to imagine the processes, as I said, of mobility. So what I wanted to do was find out about vagrants' practices of walking, stopping, resting, seeking shelter, moving on, and relocating, creating spaces and places for themselves, and also being out of place. And all of the ways I did that, I'll start to talk a little bit more about. But there are two kind of key ideas that helped shape uh, these processes of mobility of the vagrant. The first uh, is the idea about how the economy was changing, and the second is around urbanisation. So first of all, the health of the colonial economy, as I mentioned earlier, depended on a mobile workforce and forms of mobile labour. The vibrant movement of colonial Sydney, with people moving between ports, wharves, city streets and back again, 
is indicative of the potential complexity of social interactions between all kinds of people. This was an urban economy full of marginal workers, including hawkers, fruiterers, match sellers, who were all casually employed. Hundreds of people, including children, worked as rag pickers in 1876, scouring the city for old cloth rags. Work could be highly erratic, with jobs allocated day by day, according to chance, in part because of shifting demands from pastoralism inland. People seeking work knew that the population swelled with the seasons. In winter, rural workers headed to the city, taking their place among the vagrants and dossers, as contemporary observers noted. Historians can trace occupational seasons via census data. There was also small makeshift factory work becoming more common in Sydney in the 1860s and 1870s, but it was also a regular and often casual work. Melbourne was similarly uneven in its work opportunities, although the gold rushes of the 1850s and 60s meant that more wealth flowed through the city and helped to create the growth of towns in the regional areas of Victoria. Low paid and casual work was, like Sydney, found around the wharves and river and around the railway yards in small factories in the inner west and inner north of the city. Hobart in the 1840s, like the other colonies, was already suffering through economic recession, with no work for men who were circulating looking for opportunity. And this hardship continued until the early 1870s, when a boom in the mining of minerals started on the west coast of Tasmania. The shipping industry in and around Hobart and other ports was built on the mobility of seafaring men who moved between places on ships bound for other parts of the colonies for trade, transporting goods and people and bringing news of other places. These ships docked on occasion and workers sometimes had to find their next berth. Yet these men assumed potent social visibility as objects of pity and subjects of reform, as historian Francis Steele argues, possibly because their highly mobile working lives left them vulnerable to a lack of social connections. There were high rates of desertion from ships and absence without leave, making seafarers susceptible to prosecution for these offences of mobility, as well as to vagrancy charges. And I've omitted some evidence here because there's lots to tell, but there are a number of men arrested on the wharves uh, as vagrants blind drunk on the wharves because they've left their ship and just gone to the pub. In the data underpinning the study, sailors are found in each colony's list of vagrancy prosecutions with men from England, Ireland, Scotland, Jamaica, America, Canada, Cuba, Norway, Finland, Italy, Germany, Sweden, and Austria uh, arrested in many places in the colonies. So it's very multicultural. So to the second theme of urbanization, Life on the streets in the emerging cities of Australia and New Zealand was often smelly, dirty, dangerous and noisy. Urban histories of Melbourne describe this and the contestation over footpaths, litter and noxious trades, problems of drainage, among other problems experienced by people who were making their way, or finding shelter in lanes, alleys and alcoves, as well as public parks. There were health risks, typhoid infections caused by bacteria, worsened by poor hygiene, killed many people in Melbourne through the 1860s and 70s. High rates of infection and mortality in the city's suburbs when compared with British towns. Hobart was scrutinised for its urban and rural living conditions in the 1880s. A series of reports noting the prevalence and threat of diseases, including small, smallpox and typhoid. Public health concerns included the presence of sewerage, cesspits and pigsties, all adding to the picture of slums and destitution um, among children in the colony. And Auckland was similarly a place where animals and people lived in close proximity and where sickness and poor behaviours like heavy drinking and fighting tended to affect neighbourly communities and relationships, especially when conflict was obvious and violent. So the harbour cities uh, in this study grew up messily around ports and water and the outline of the coast. And Sydney, Auckland, Hobart all shared similarities. These were visible through the presence of colonial cultures of exchange and communication with local Indigenous peoples who had been progressively displaced by the presence of military settlements. With the regimen imposed by the institutions of justice and medicine in the early years of the colonies, Streets in Melbourne were arranged on a grid 
while in Sydney, Auckland and Hobart, they were less predictable in their organisation. Streets could be narrow, windy and hilly, with people living close to each other and living conditions jostling with leisure and legality every day. And it was important for these places to establish parks and gardens, one of their lovely legacies, really. So what I was trying to do when I was writing these sections was imagine how the vagrants, people arrested as vagrants, would have navigated all these types of spaces. And, of course, I found that vagrants could be annoying and threatening to other people in these spaces. How they occupied public or shared space was contested, and they often were seen to infringe spaces owned and occupied by others. They were also the easy targets of complainants who could tackle the politics of space by blaming vagrants for vandalism or taking up in places where they were not wanted. In June of 1863, John Ferguson, who owned a business in George Street, Sydney, wrote to the mayor of Sydney to ask for repairs to his window that was broken by a vagrant named John Hendon, drawing attention to the problem of casual damage by vagrants in the city. Historians point to the prevalence of window smashing by people who were unable to enter cafes or shops, and contemporaries also noted the frequency of this type of property damage. Hendon had thrown a brick bat at the window and then sought protection, making an application at the police court, which was not granted. And Ferguson, the complainant, was told by police that taking the matter to court to recover his costs would be a waste of time. It's really interesting. I was looking into the breaking of windows, and it's a, it's an issue in our present as well, apparently. Um, patterns of, of behaviour by people who live rough um, in breaking glass on windows is, is quite common. So it's a really interesting kind of piece in this little bit of history. There's also complaints in 1877 by the Australian Jockey Club. Uh, they complained to uh, their municipal council in Sydney about damage to a fence separating the race course from the water reserve that was caused by a fire lit by vagrants, allegedly. And vagrants were um, singled out for their lack of regard by others because, uh, you know, people saw them dumping rubbish and that kind of thing. Similar complaints were made by vagrants in 19th century Melbourne. Sue Davies found evidence of complaints to the police in 1889 made by the owner of the Age newspaper, David Syme, who was disturbed by the presence of vagrants in the entrance to his newspaper building. The public library also provided a warm and safe space for Melbourne's loafers in 1887. So in each of these Sydney and Melbourne complaints, vagrants were named as a group, blamed for unsociable actions and behaviour, and characterised as an annoyance, or worse, by the complainant to the council. Borders like fences were important to keep vagrants out and away from civilised spaces, but also to prevent them from occupying empty spaces that they may then colonise as their own. These complaints read as very familiar documents of dispute over social spaces and places, and they're also opportunistic in their portrayal of vagrants as aggressive and destructive. But taking a rounded view, they also tell us about the people behind the label as vagrant, their individual dealings with shop owners, their group behaviour and seeking warmth and shelter, their access to clean locations or storage for rubbish, as well as their apparent disregard for other people on those occasions when they're transgressing social norms. So I'd like to head now into talking about a few of the aspects of everyday lives of vagrants that offer potential for interpreting mobility. Walking, seeking shelter from weather or for sleep, as well as eating and drinking, can tell us about the basic needs of people who were arrested as vagrants. In my book, I also talk about violence on the streets, um, violence against women, but I won't talk about that here today. Uh, what we know about vagrants and their social connections and bonds within and across communities is also important. But the social worlds of vagrants tend to emerge only as fragments of the stories told about their skirmishes with the law. I think increased um, evidence and, and further research about um, their sociality and social worlds could offer more insight into their tenacity and perseverance as people living outside settled society. But walking and wandering were the mainstay of vagrants, both urban and rural. And reflecting on the physical activity of walking gives us insight into the way vagrants use their bodies to move between places, to occupy spaces, and to negotiate their relationship to fixed places. So starting with shelter and sleep, 
Contemporaries seemed to be regularly offended by discoveries of people who were lodging in open air. Yet housing from the earliest days in the colonies was modest, rough and even temporary, especially in the 1820s in and around Hobart in Van Diemen's Land. Historians suggest that temporary structures uh, resemble huts used by Aboriginal people, with kangaroo hunters, stockmen, sealers, bushrangers and even small farmers living in basic A-frame shelters made of brush and trees. As the settlement grew and changed, reports of people found lying on the ground or lying on some rags near, near the bridge, for example, became more frequent by the 1860s. Seeking shelter from the weather, but also from the outside world and its intrusions on privacy, houseless persons of the 19th century had the option of being cared for inside one of the colonial institutions of the period. In Hobart in 1865, Ellen Boylan was charged with vagrancy and in lodging in the open air in Goldman Street without having any visible means. Boylan pleaded guilty to the charge, telling the bench that she had been at the invalid depot, but having come out yesterday for a holiday, she had taken drink and stayed out beyond the time. Of course, the newspaper poked fun at her idea of taking a holiday and she was sentenced to three months with hard labour. Just as an aside, I have a colleague in New Zealand who's a, a social psychologist who's written about um, homeless people who can take holidays in our present. So there's another sort of strand of our contemporary uh, sort of imaginings and thinking there as well. Like others, though, Boylan had arrived as a convict and spent much of her time moving between welfare and carceral institutions. Looking for shelter often meant a cycle of movement between living outdoors and being the recipient of welfare relief, such as accommodation in a benevolent home. Boylan's experience of punishment in Tasmania related to her former identity, sorry, her identity as a former convict who had arrived in Van Diemen's Land in 1843 with a seven-year sentence when she was 41. She arrived, we know, with greying hair, a scar over her left eye. She came from Limerick in Ireland. She was convicted in Hobart Quarter Sessions in 1850 of stealing and sentenced to two years transportation with hard labour in the female factory. She was then again convicted, um, this time of drunkenness, and three more times in 1855 in June, July and December, suggesting that she's kind of living publicly in, in her drunkenness at, the, at that time. In December 1867, she pleaded guilty to disturbing the peace and in February 1868, she was employed as a servant in a public house called the Plough at Harrow when she was a witness in an assault case. So we find all sorts of evidence of her seeking shelter and seeking home. She finds shelter later in the Cascades Invalid Depot as a pauper between 1868 and 1870. Eventually, she dies aged 67 in 1871. Boylan's journey from Ireland to Tasmania was plotted by a life of surviving as an old woman, who had few choices aside from domestic work and reliance on institutions. When there was no more work, she would fall on these hard times. And she had experiences of the criminal justice system peppering her lifetime, but also shaping her ability to maintain a stable life in the colonies. Her access to shelter was shaped by all of these experiences and by her identity as a criminal, a pauper and a domestic servant. Open air sleeping was common. Others found creative, if unpopular, ways to get shelter. In October of 1860, Robert Barclay found himself an unoccupied house in Anthill Street, Hobart, one Saturday night, but was arrested and charged with having no visible means of subsistence. He told the court that he did have money, and at the police watch house he was found with a small sum in his pockets, and he'd offered to pay somebody called Mrs Sheehy for uh, his lodgings. Yet his story of seeking a place to stay was undermined by the fact that he was found concealed in the chimney of the kitchen by police who were alerted by the woman who lived in the house next door. It did not bode well for Barclay, who was sentenced to three months imprisonment with hard labour. He'd arrived in Tasmania on a ship called the China in 1846 on a seven-year sentence, and he lived a life of being idle and disorderly, inverted commas, at least as far as the records suggest, until the early 20th century. So there are several more convictions, and this is quite common in the records with people, uh, very very often recidivist uh, offenders and being arrested multiple times. Like Barclay, hiding in the chimney, seeking shelter in other people's houses was a tactic used repeatedly by middle-aged Morris Jeffrey, 
He'd been identified in 1899 at the time of his first offence as an American. He was born in New York in 1861, and he'd come from New Zealand, um, New, New Zealand's Otago region, suggesting he was originally a gold seeker. He was known as a commercial traveller. He first caused a nuisance before he was arrested three more times for being idle and disorderly, with each new charge attracting a greater sentence. And the Tasmanian Launceston Examiner presented the evidence against Geoffrey, who was wandering abroad in February 1901. And this is an account of, of what they said. William Sims, state school teacher at Invermay, said he'd seen the defendant twice. The first time was on January 27 last, when he came to his residence in the morning and went into the drawing room. When the witness came in, he was playing the piano, making himself perfectly at home. The defendant asked him for assistance and he gave him one shilling. On the 13th of the present month, the defendant came to the school and again asked for assistance, but this time the witness refused him. And other witnesses agreed that Geoffrey was unwanted in their spaces. Robert John Brooks, licensee of the commercial hotel, said that during the past 10 days, Geoffrey had frequently visited his place. Sometimes he paid for a drink and other times he begged one. He would go into the parlour and lie on the sofa to go to sleep. And of course, looking for a place to sleep was entirely rational. Many instances of men and women being found in all kinds of places also shows that the police were assiduous in their tracking of unwanted lodges. People were found sleeping under the shelter of an unfinished house, in stables concealed under the manger, or asleep in an unfinished building, as shown by just a few examples. So there are many uh, stories of people seeking places uh, to shelter, and they were seen as a nuisance. In a letter again to the Mayor of Sydney from somebody called George Kelly and his friends in 1883, we find that uh, vagrants were squatting in a, a vacant condemned building in Injun Street, Ultimo, and this was creating for people in the community, uh, probably a problem for people in the community. It was seen as a harbour for vagrants and an eyesore. So people living rough found shelter in abandoned deserted houses, often located in rundown areas in the inner suburbs. For those living on the streets or between uh, periods of secure housing, safe shelter was important, and it is in the present too, if you think about people now living on the streets, living rough. Safe shelter is important for adequate sleep, to give people energy for the day ahead, which involved much walking between places. And in the end of my book, I have an epilogue where I talk about, uh, in our contemporary moment, how many kilometres people um, who are living rough walk every day. So going into the bush to sleep was, for some people, an act of self-preservation. And uh, when the police go around scouring the town for undesirables, <laughs> they sort of dig them out of some of these um, hidey holes. We can also find out where and how people slept and found shelter by examining the reports of people who set out to offer charitable help and assistance to the homeless and unemployed in the urban centres. Searching the likely locations of the Melbourne unemployed and, and, and homeless men late in the 1880s, two Christian missionaries went on foot to the kinds of places where they may find these men. They reported that they spent the night going through the lodging houses, reserve grounds, on the Spencer Street docks and wharves, found traces of men sleeping on the banks of the Yarra River. Physician John Singleton, who you can see here, established several night shelters for needy women and men in the 1870s and 1880s in the suburb of Collingwood in Melbourne's inner east. Collingwood was, of course, the site of many working families and workers' housing, close to factories and many of the city's charities and religious orders. The men's shelter was named the Bluebell after a public hotel and located in Perry Street, and it operated from 1887. The establishment of these shelters was simply, as well as being a charitable act, to counter the habits of people who slept rough in those other buildings on verandas and sheds and beneath shrubs in public gardens or elsewhere, as Singleton pointed out. So this was a, to ameliorate some of that public concern. Just go to this one. A photograph depicting a woman's um, place to rest and sleep in the Auckland domain in 1915 was described as an unknown abode in a photographic supplement to the Auckland Weekly News. Elizabeth Allison Woods was an elderly woman and she lived in the scrub in the Auckland domain for some time. She'd also received help from some charitable people 
Yet it seemed that the court worried whether any of the homes would take her in. So there was a problem with charitable assistance in the form of places to, um, particularly to take elderly women and men in all of the colonies. She was very weak owing to her mode of living, they said, and had to be sent to the hospital where she'd remained for the last 10 days. Appearing before the court, she was sentenced to a 12-month period in prison. And so many of the people in, in my book um, who go to prison for three-month, six-month or longer stints actually find the prison as a place to get fed and to have shelter. This sad solution was judged to be the only way at this time to help her to live safely and to remove her from the public space where her presence probably, possibly offended other people. Being without a home was a reality for many people who show up in the newspapers and police records of vagrancy. No home was a newspaper headline often used when contemporaries were reflecting on the imperfect use of the vagrancy law to manage poverty in the 19th century. There were boarding houses and these could provide shelter, places to sleep and some sustenance for others on the move. In urban Melbourne, these were distributed around the suburbs of Emerald Hills and Kilda, Paran, Richmond and Collingwood. And they also most likely offered access to food and drink. Public houses or hotels were centres of communal life for men and some women. And some vagrants may have tried their luck eating food sold or served in public establishments. Um, such as stealing from bakeries and running away, that kind of thing. There's several cases like that. Outside of urban areas, men who subsisted between jobs in rural areas lived on very simple diets of tea, damper and mutton. Okay, I'm going to draw to um, a close soon but, I, soon, but I just wanted to mention that um, in the book, I also try and each chapter um, has a story uh, of one individual that's developed in somewhat more depth. And so this chapter about everyday lives features the story of a woman uh, who was known as Sarah Jones, and she had a number of aliases. So I'll just touch on, on her story very briefly be before coming to some conclusions. And partly I wanted to do this in this chapter to draw out um, and to deepen and thicken the way an account of everyday life might work if we found an individual to settle on. Um, as it happened, I couldn't find out as much about Sarah Jones as I really wanted to. Uh, the sources are very partial. But she's one of the many people who appears in the data set that I use in the New South Wales Police Gazettes. She became notorious for her various encounters with the police. She appears several times in the captured data set, and there are 10 entries for her in the data set between 1869 and 1877. But she continued to offend after that time, as shown in court and prison entries in the State Archives of New South Wales. Although the details are relatively consistent each time, there are subtle changes in the way information is recorded about Jones, so we need to be a bit cautious. She used a range of aliases and there are discrepancies in the record, but we also could see this as something of her agency and her agility. She was someone who could slip through the net of street surveillance, so our, our ability to tell a story of her is somewhat compromised. But we know, partly because of her notoriety, that she managed her everyday existence uh, on the streets and continued to survive challenges presented by the colonial urban life. So according to the detail of um, her life taken at each of her arrests, she was likely born in Ireland sometime in the 1840s, but she often changed the date of birth. She had dark hair. Her eyes were recorded as being brown or grey. She didn't seem to have attracted much attention for her appearance, which makes her a bit more elusive in the historical record. But it's also interesting because she had a popular nickname in the Police Gazette that the police gave her, and it's very unflattering. She was known as the Cockroach. After its use in the 1870s, this term was popularised in police and court reports in the newspapers, and it took hold as shorthand for her in the official notations about her crimes. For me, and perhaps, it highlights her ability to continue to thrive in the grime and grit of the growing city, but it also suggests the police imagined her to be a nuisance they couldn't eradicate, as in other cases of repeat offenders in, in the stories I tell. The cockroach imbued Jones with a sense of her indestructible character. And uh, just when people thought they'd kind of caught her, she would reappear. And in 1888, and, and one newspaper says, the cockroach has not yet been squashed. So it's quite unpleasant, but perhaps if we turn it on, on its head, it tells us something of her resilience as well. 
Sydney streets were mapped out by police as districts, and I talk about this in my policing chapter. To manage populations, there were spaces for work, travel and leisure. There were laneways and alleys giving access to doorways and privacy, especially away from the main streets or corners where groups gathered. It's likely, um, based on her arrests, that Sarah worked as a prostitute, and that meant that uh, she likely solicited for paying customers around the streets of the red light district. Her own movements around the city are not easy to track and not always mentioned in the newspaper reports of her arrests, but she was most likely found around the central area of the city, including Macquarie Street. And Sydney, of course, was a place where it was relatively easy to obtain alcohol and to frequent public houses. She was often viewed through the prism of the common charge of being inebriate, along with many other women and men who chose to enjoy these habits of life in the city. So we can find out as much as we can about Sarah Jones, and I've really truncated my uh, discussion here. Um, we can only think, though, that her continued stints in Darlinghurst Jail, while they may have been somewhat of a, a kind of protection in between sort of living on the streets, it must have been frightening. Execution by hanging took place at Darlinghurst until 1889. Public hangings were conducted to crowds until 1852. Between the 1870s and 1890s, late 1890s, Sarah Jones was sent to Darlinghurst at least 20 times, with 10 of these times clearly for vagrancy charges, as the prosecution data shows. Be it ever so humble, there's no place like jail for a tough specimen, read the newspaper report titled Home, Sweet Home, on one of her arrests. So I'll come to some conclusions now. These indications of the life lived by Sarah Jones are fleeting. The women and men whose everyday existence featured in the records of crime and punishment remind us of the exigencies of living rough, the need for shelter, sleep, food, protection from violence and human contact and friendship, although I haven't talked about those here. The sheer practicality of life on the street for vagrants meant that luxuries like human community may have been difficult to create. But the evidence also shows the strength of human bonds and emerging communities of care and welfare in the stories I tell, even though the slices of life available are momentary glimpses of a busy, dynamic colonial context that ranges over places with local characteristics. It's paradoxical that colonial society was both ambivalent about mobility and yet founded on the grand project of immigration and settlement. Demographic transitions during the 19th century created the massive conditions, or sorry, created the conditions for massive upheaval and transition and disruption to the lives of many people around the world, from Europe and Britain to North America, Australia and New Zealand. The idea that everyone had access to opportunity was a fiction that propelled immigration. Mobile identities were shaped by both socioeconomic circumstance and also by shared understandings and collective expectations. And so elsewhere in my, my stories that I tell, I do talk about the construction uh, of the story of uh, the vagrant and the person who is an unwanted mobile person. Thanks, everybody. Thank you for an absolutely uh, fascinating um, uh, paper, Kathy. That was really, really interesting. Um, I'd like to um, throw things open for questions. I wonder if I might shamelessly take advantage of my position as chair and sure. first. I'm really interested in the different um, uh, uh, categories of, um, of legitimate and illegitimate mobility. Mm -hmm. uh, and I was sort of, you, you, you alluded to the way in which Indigenous mobility is also classed as illegitimate yeah. or mm -hmm. in the same period. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent are these categories imagined differently or the solutions are imagined as, as, as different? And to what extent are these overlapping categories? Mm -hmm. Well, um, your question makes me think of something that might be useful to explain, and that is that um, some Aboriginal and Māori people were arrested as vagrants, but not very many. Mm. So, uh, in fact, the laws as they came in post-1835, the different colonial uh, pieces of law in all these places that I'm talking about, um, 
make it illegal for a European to consort with an Aboriginal person or a Māori person. And so the consorting charge is the one that's kind of attracting the attention. So looking at, um, it, you know, they didn't want Europeans to go off and, and live with uh, these groups of Indigenous peoples. Um, however, the consorting charge isn't used very often. Mm -hmm. And so what's really interesting, I do talk in a couple of my chapters about the arrests of Aboriginal people and some Māori people, and I've written elsewhere about this as well. But certainly you are right. I mean, um, mobility, the mobility of these different Indigenous peoples is imagined differently. And one of the reasons I speculate that, uh, for example, Aboriginal people in Victoria and New South Wales don't turn up quite so much in the social institutions is that they're also being uh, removed from lands and displaced. So they're kind of being treated differently and diff with different laws in mind uh, uh, that were being created around the same time, around Aboriginal protection, for example. Mm -hmm. um, in the case of New Zealand, Māori people, the increasing nature of urbanisation brings Māori people into contact with Europeans and that ends badly for them because then they tend to be caught up in European laws. Uh, so, yeah, I think it's a really it's a really good question and a really, a really interesting one to, to unpack. I think Amanda Nickelbeck, who's a historian who's known to us, has written a lot more about Aboriginal vagrancy and the vagrancy laws, um, particularly for South Australia, if anybody's interested. Yeah. Great. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, other questions? Effie. Thanks, Kathy. That was great. I was immediately going to ask you a question about soldiers, and then I realized that I already asked you a question about soldiers when I last when I last saw you speak about this topic um, at the the conference in Glasgow. Um, my question is uh, about because I'm I'm so fascinated with this, by this idea of people in these in between lives and sort of going about their lives and making very conscious decisions about you know how their lives are going to look despite the fact that they're not seen in that way. So with these conscious decisions in mind, were there any ways of dealing with vagrants that we can see perhaps now in the context of rough living now as positive, not, I don't think positive is the right word, but advantageous in some way to the vagrants? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. I suppose I would argue that uh, uh, it's funny, but not funny, it's disturbing the laws around vagrancy in Australian jurisdictions were only repealed fairly recently, so in the 2000s. So some states still had the vagrancy laws right up until 2000 and something, I think. So, um, and, and in 2022, there was a politician in Queensland that talked about um, reintroducing the criminalisation of homelessness. So um, I suppose that there were, in the past, there may have been advantages for people coming into contact with um, authorities who then directed them gently towards, or not, not even gently, but, you know, punitively towards welfare authorities. Um, I didn't mention here, but one opportunity for sentencing, a judge could suggest that, particularly for women, that they go to a Samaritan home rather than going to prison. So they could make that choice and they could be sent and then, you know, spend some time there. But often the women didn't want to take that choice. Um, people could also pay a fine, but often they weren't allowed to pay a fine. So, oh, sorry, they weren't able to pay a fine. So, I mean, I think... Maybe it's that the answer is something in the in the interaction with well-meaning um, authorities or um, people who wanted to recognise the problem, such as John Singleton, the doctor in Melbourne. You know, maybe there were sort of ways in which that contact could have enabled people to find solutions other than living on the street. But I'm not quite sure if I'm really answering your question. I don't know. It's about the kind of agency, isn't it, really? No, I just had this wonderful idea that there would be people, there would be particular things that would help vagrants in this roundabout way but you have answered the question thanks okay <laughs> thanks Nancy thanks so much Kathy and always great to hear more about this really exciting book um so I guess my question does follow on from Effie's but it was forming as I listened to you talk about people being repeatedly sentenced to time in incarceration and um I don't know if that was with or without hard labor or other you know add-ons but I mean one of the um, uh, initiatives by the late 19th and early 20th centuries was to be training people giving them practical skills while they were in custody so that when they went back out they would have a marketable skill and wouldn't have to resort to crime or, or vagrancy and I wondered if you saw any evidence of that and and I'm particularly thinking of um Jared Davidson, Davison's book, um, 
blood and dirt. I don't know if you've seen that. I It's about New Zealand and uh, how much the prison labour was used in the making of New Zealand, where there's this idea that, you know, Australia has convict built buildings and walls and so on all over the place, but not in New Zealand because they didn't have convicts. But of course, a lot of their uh, infrastructure was constructed by people who were serving prison terms. Uh, and while that was dreadful in many cases, it, it would mean that they went out with more skills than they went in with. And yeah, I just wondered how that played out with people uh, incarcerated for vagrancy. Yeah, such a great question. And my experience this year, I've given, this is my third paper um, after the book was published, and it's been really great to kind of test out things, but after the fact. So um, I've often explained, I've touched on so many things that I, I feel like I've skimmed over the surface of the prison conditions in order to sort of try and uh, get to the heart of the storytelling about some some of these vagrants themselves. I did come across examples of people uh, who ended up staying on in prisons and working in the prison. Um, in Melbourne, there's a couple of cases that I came across. Um, some of the men, after repeat offences, do get hard labour. The women are more likely to be sent off to some of those more, um, you know, welfare-type homes and institutions. So I didn't see anything kind of systematic in terms of how they might have then used uh, prison as a sort of reformative space. Um, it's what what really is the overwhelming thing that I've seen is that people are sent in for short stints, go out, resume their old ways, and then end up going back in. And that's why they surface so often the police because that's because they become well known, um, and that the police really are onto who they are. There's a there's a sense of their identities, you know. Hence the construction of of nicknames for some of these people like Sarah Jones. Um, but I'm really interested in what you say, and I would have loved to have delved more deeply into some of these sort of more, more vertical topics. You know, there's some other ones too, like health and illness, uh, which I touch on, um, aged care and disability. So I think that's really ripe. And if we if we wanted to attract students to come and work on some of these topics, I think there'd be so much there. That'd be great. But um, mine was more of a surface look across some of those issues, yeah. Yeah, thanks. Um, I was wondering, uh, when you were just talking about prisons there versus other institutions, I'm more familiar with the um, sort of uh, welfare institutions in, on the continent than I am in the British Empire. Mm. But my impression is that they often weren't very different to prisons, yeah. were they? Mm. Was it, am I right in that imagining? Oh. Yeah, pretty basic. Yeah, and of course, as you know, I spent my career looking at the asylum in the 19th century and, uh, you know, some of the... In fact, what colonial societies had the option of were some of these people ended up in the asylums and they were there because not because they were mad, but because they were uh, homeless, poor, mm. and they'd been on the streets and so on. And then there's a bit of a conversation in the background in the records about does that person belong here? Should they go? So there's a definitely interplay between these different types of institutions. Mm -hmm. And I think they're pretty simplistic in their in their support and care. One consistent thing, going back to Nancy's point, is um, that I know more about with asylums but also benevolent institutions is um, labour and the, the positive use of labour to reform and help mm. people recover. Um, but when you get to aged care, that's not possible because people are often very infirm and, and feeble and unwell. So that sort of suggests to me there's a huge gap in, in the colonies as the infrastructure just isn't there to sort of establish enough support for the elderly. And that's another great topic for somebody to come along and study um, in terms of our current concerns. And thinking about, you know, what we're seeing now with uh, pressures on aged care and the aged care system, a lot of these things have been creaking along since the late 19th century with the introduction of age pe aged care pension in New Zealand and Australia. Um, but the opportunity to kind of help people land in a safe space, particularly if they're unwell or they've had sort of, um, you know, no community around them. Yeah, it's a, it's a very interesting question in the 19th century. Mm. Yeah, very... mm. And and one that has the, 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 that issue of where people end up going, you know, has um, echoes, I guess, with the present day in the sense that I've certainly read reports in Britain of people seeking in the current very difficult circumstances to go to prison because it's a place where they can rely on getting yeah. food and shelter or something yeah, like that. Exactly, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so I hope that what I was saying about the sort of parallels is it's meant to be suggestive and it's meant to be a way of thinking. And there's no accident, and I was going to talk about this more, but there's no accident that um some of our historians in the 1980s were writing about these topics you know, at a time when those social history concerns were also being reflected in the world around them. So I think the same could be said of our present. Yeah. Mm, absolutely. 
All righty. Well, uh, please um, join me in thanking Kathy for an absolutely fascinating um, paper. Uh, just before you um, you go, a quick note that our next event will be on Friday, the 20th of September from 10 to 11 a.m. And that event will be online in person. Our speaker, uh, Garrett or Chip Van Dyke, will present on the secret life of ephemera, everyday archaeology and cultural history. And we hope to see you then. Thanks, everybody.